grab your favorite alcoholic or non-alcoholic beverage, drink responsibly, do not drink and drive, and enjoy the latest episode of Why Complain When You Can Wine. Welcome to Why Complain When You Can Wine, making sense of the senseless. Join us as we attempt to make sense of toxic nonsense while drinking wine or any other beverage of your choice. I am Dr. Jody Larman, licensed clinical psychologist in the state of California, and anything and everything we discuss on this podcast is purely for psychoeducational and entertainment purposes only. And tonight, I am drinking Spyglass. Lovely. Cabernet from Paso Robles, California. Mm. California wine. So I am not, I mean, I, I, it's funny because my budget for wine has had to go up. (laughs) <laughs> because prices have gone up. I remember it used to be like $10. I would go to Trader Joe's and buy under $10, you can get a lot of wines. Mm-hmm. And now it's like under $20, they have a lot of wines. And I wait till they're on sale and I will buy six or more um, mix, mix and matches and stuff. But I've had $100 bottles of wine mm-hmm. that I don't necessarily, I had like a $7 bottle of wine one time. I went on a cruise. And my husband's friend, my friend's husband brought a hundred dollar bottle of wine. And so we had his wine. And then later I went and had a glass of wine and I'm like, I like mine so much better. So oh, interesting. Yeah. No. And my glass is from the Food and Wine Festival 2023 at Disney California Adventure. Oh, fun. The queen of Disneyland. You go all the time. We you went on it. Sunday. We took my I know. Niece and my baby niece, who is two years old. We took her for the first time. She could not stand. She she did not like any of the rides. She didn't like pirates. Didn't like Haunted Mansion. Didn't like Winnie the Pooh. No. Fell She's asleep. Too- yeah, fell asleep at so Snow White. But or on uh, it's a small world. But I said to her, I said, "Are you having fun?" She goes, "Yeah." And I go, do you like Disneyland? Yeah. And I'm thinking, is she just saying yes? And I said, do you like the ride? She goes, no. <laughs> like, okay. Do you have to ring truthfully? She really yeah. is. So. Yeah, I know. This is me and my wine. That's <laughs> excellent. Well, I'm not drinking wine. So I am um, Brianne Burry and I am a psychotherapist up in Vancouver, British Columbia. And I am drinking rum tonight. Oh, is it wine. regular rum or spiced rum? Uh, it's cracking, spiced, and it's yummy. But um, I do like my wine. But as Dr. Lerman and I were talking before, that's my old neck of the woods. I worked in that industry a long time, and I think my body is sort of built up a, a bit of a d- d- <laughs> lack of tolerance for reds because I get headaches. Anyway, so I try to stick to my spirits because I don't seem to react as much. Um, so our topic this evening, folks, is going to be on some of the distress and I think mental health issues post-pandemic and what that looks like in society within North America, maybe even around the world. But I mean, generally I'm Canadian, you're American, so we can kind of stick to our the neck of the woods here. But um and and what that looks like and where people's anxieties have been elevated. So yeah. Dr. Larman, what do you what do you where do you want to start with this? You know, not just anxiety, because when we think of mental health, a lot of people think of mental health as depression or anxiety Mm -hmm. or the paranoid schizophrenic out on the street that's disheveled and homeless and talking to everybody. And it's like that, that I have no mental health issues at all. That's mental health. Mm -hmm. But mental health is also loneliness. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be clinically depressed. You don't have to have generalized anxiety disorder to have symptoms that really never maybe came about no. prior to the pandemic. No, I've been having a lot of people telling me, I realize now I don't have any friends anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think it's one thing that we can kind of clarify. And I think that Dr. Larman can back me up here is, is that if you look at it, and this is sort of very Jung's way of thinking, um, is that we're on eight different mental health spectrums every human on the planet is, and that we oscillate on these spectrums through our life. And so we all have mental health issues. There's not one person on the planet that doesn't, you can't say, and I mean, when I say mental health, exactly with what she just said, we're not talking about a paranoid schizophrenic or somebody who has, is a sociopath or has as ASPD, right? ASPD. We're not talking about that. We're talking about everybody oscillates. We all have levels of anxiety, levels of fear, levels of everything, which contributes to mental health in general, right? 
right. not everybody's healthy 120% all of the time, right? We can break a wrist or break a leg, or then we've got a medical issue. It's no different with our brain. So yeah. And I think by saying that people can then recognize, um, more so about what that, um, what, uh, what, what, what we're looking at post pandemic and some of the issues. And I think, you know, one of the things that really, really, really pisses me off. And I feel very strongly about this is people do not take mental health seriously until it's serious. Mm -hmm. I know. We don't have uh, mental health issues until we have a crisis. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because of the stigma around mental health. People yes. don't want to think that there's a problem because it's, so, it's been so stigmatized for a bazillion years. So until we get rid of that, which there's more people advocating for that now, celebrities talk about it all the time. Um, we really need to continue to work on the stigma around mental health. So what would you say is the first thing that you're seeing, um, Jody? in regards well, I just, to I, I want to, before you say, before you ask me that, because I will answer that. But one of the things I, that I do want to say is when you come to therapy, at least in the United States, if you come to therapy with insurance, you have to have a billable diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So we're going to diagnose you. And even if you have, don't have clinical depression, you just have mood issues, you're going to get a diagnosis. And I really, really, really hate that we have to give a diagnosis like that because I, I think we should have preventative mental health. Mm -hmm. I agree. So that people don't get clinically depressed. They mm -hmm. don't get generalized anxiety disorder. And I know people might say, well, there's adjustment disorder, there's mood disorder, there's lower levels of diagnoses. And there are, but I wish we can go to therapy and have insurance cover it to prevent, like I'm feeling down mm -hmm. and I'm not clinically depressed, mm -hmm. but I'm feeling down because what I'm seeing since the pandemic is a lot of people who couldn't go to mental health or didn't look at mental health because I don't have clinical depression necessarily. Mm -hmm. And because they can't get insurance to bill maybe, or they don't have insurance, they don't mm -hmm. go and end up with clinical depression. Well, that's the problem is because you don't have any preventative system in place that right. can help people. See, in Canada, you don't need a diagnosis to get coverage for insurance. You don't need a diagnosis at all. I mean, if you get a diagnosis, it might be able to help cover your medication and your insurance can cover that. But to cover therapy, you don't, it depends on who you work for and what insurance coverage you have, but you don't need a diagnosis. Yeah. And so I don't like that. So what I'm seeing are people that have said to me, they, they honestly didn't realize until now that the, that the pandemic is over is, or the official state of emergency kind of thing is over that they didn't realize how much it had affected them during that time. Right. So and what, what I that you're seeing. Yeah. Yeah. What is it that you're seeing? What do you think is the first and foremost thing that you're seeing post pandemic when end people? Honestly, I see a lot of people that are, were, are, and were in toxic relationships. So uh -huh. This is interesting. This is a totally different direction that mm -hmm. they, that has now affected them to the point that they may not have realized how bad it was, mm. but when you're in a closely confined, you can't go out with your friends, you get domestic violence increased, abuse increased, mm -hmm. all of that. So I'm having a lot of people coming to therapy with a lot of toxic trauma. History. Yeah, toxic yeah. trauma. Toxic trauma based on the fact that I guess with the pandemic, again, everybody was so isolated. So they stuck. Everything escalated. Yeah. Yeah. And everything escalated because they had no choice. They were stuck with the people that they were stuck with. And there was no ability to, um, you know, be out and away from people. And so it just, like you said, it exacerbated an already problematic situation where people could have possibly escaped these situations, but had no choice, but to stay in it. So that's a really good point. Um, I think I'm seeing much more agoraphobia and social anxiety from people. I people see social not, anxiety in adolescence. I've been yeah. seeing adolescence. Yeah, I'm seeing it in adults and I've got friends and I've got people who just have don't have the desire to get out and connect with people socially the way that they used to. Um, there's a bit of a phobia and a fear. And I will say that myself, who's a very social person, now I'm very sensitive and I definitely need to recharge when I'm around a lot of people, but I don't have a problem getting out and being social and connecting with people. It was a weird feeling when we were allowed out again and it, it being in a busy environment was overwhelming. I felt really super overwhelmed. So for somebody who's 
a bit of an extrovert. This was a very shocking phenomenon. And it was something I recognized right away. I'm like, those who are not extroverted and are more naturally introverted anyway, is going to really impact them a great deal. And I saw lots of friends who had social anxiety to begin with, who wanted to just completely isolate and stay that way. I've seen a lot of adolescents in school because school went remotely and now they have to go back to school. And sometimes it's a new school because a lot of them graduated Mm -hmm. um, or going to college or things like that. Um, I have also seen where, like, I know myself, it's like you said, I'm very much an extrovert, but I'm also an introvert. So now I'm trying to find this balance of, I want to go out, but I want to stay in my bed. (laughs) Yeah. See, that's where I find myself too. Like I'm actually, yeah, I'm far more introverted (laughs) since the pandemic, but this is again. And if we go back in history and you look at the last pandemic we had was 1918 in the Spanish flu. But that was in such a different time period where there was no TV and no social media. They had radio, maybe. And there was no, you know, the the isolation was different. And the impact on people was different because they didn't live in today's society where we have all these ways to communicate. Um, They didn't have that back then. But what was the impact that we saw when coming out of the pandemic, they said that there was still a lot of social is- isolation, but it was it was not quite the same. The mental health issues weren't quite the same. And back then, and they were also like, dealing with war and different yeah. other social issues that PTSD, were which they didn't know was PTSD. It was what shell yeah. shock, shell um, shock, yeah, combat neurosis, yeah, is what they called it. Yeah, so there were other things going on, and what women were hysterical. Yeah. Okay. So again, this is an era, if we go back and Dr. Larman and I know this is a historical part of psychology and Freud and, and different thinking, Freud, high roll. <laughs> <laughs> so not Freudian. I say right? so not Freudian. Yeah. I make Freudian slips. <laughs> you don't have a yeah, no, that's not the reason, dude. He was and a he coked had, out addict actually, uh, who loved yeah. his people. They figured it out. In, in the beginning, but then he veered away because of the social um, backlash he got when he first discovered hysteria in women. But we're digressing here. If you look at um, uh, where people came from and then war was the forefront of people going to combat and dying seemed a little bit and severe and having the PTSD that once the pandemic was over, they were just like, great, nobody's going to die anymore. And I think people just got back to life. They didn't have time to sit and reflect and think. I believe the way that we do now because of the luxuries that we have in today's world and our society with the comforts of, you know, like your home, social media, all these different, you know, uh, uh, media networks and different things where people have the time to think about it. Back then it was like, no, we've got, you know, to worry about, okay, they're not going to die now. And that, you know, we've got famine and we've got, you know, then the Great Depression hit and we've got to be able to get back so we can feed ourselves and survive. (laughs) And then another war right after that. And then another war right after that, right? Again, they didn't have time to sit there and almost dwell in a way that the way that we have. have. I think that's a huge. And looking at social media, I think social media is a blessing and a curse. Oh, I agree. It's like everything else. It's a, not everything, but a blessing and a curse because I think social media allowed us to stay connected. Zoom allowed us to stay connected in ways that we couldn't. However, it also... I think social media is great to find support, Mm -hmm. but there was also the, if you have this and this and this, you're mentally ill. If you have that and that and that, you have this diagnosis. So people also started being like, oh my gosh, Mm -hmm. I'm more aware of what I have and who I am, whether it was right or wrong or not, and didn't have the ability to go out and do therapy. Mm -hmm. People are still surprised when I say Zoom therapy. Mm -hmm. I know. Zoom therapy, you know, more of my clients like that. Now I actually stopped using my office space as much because there was no point in paying the rental fees because I didn't, there was people weren't coming in person. They just wanted to stick to doing zooms and it's just more convenient. Although it does, it is a little bit different when you see somebody in person versus online. There's pros and cons of both. There's pros and cons to both, right? Like as therapists, it's harder for us to detect certain things because body language can be hidden. And um, that's part of being able to actively listen to people. So when we can't see them fidgeting their feet and doing whatever, we're missing major cues. Because a huge amount, whether people want to believe it or not, 
of psychology is based on observation. It is. It's all, it's mostly not it's, necessarily yes. what you say. It's what you're doing. Yeah. It's active listening is more about body language than it actually is listening to the person speak. Because again, their body language will tell a different story than what's coming out of their mouth. So it's. <laughs> and yeah. I have people, especially right during the pandemic, because I started doing um, telehealth during the pandemic. I actually started December 1st of 2020. Mm -hmm. I actually got COVID December 1st of 2020. So when I tested positive or found out that I had COVID, I was like, oh, and I was at work. So that's mm -hmm. the benefit is it didn't stop me from working. No. But at the same time, um, people were trying to adjust. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing that I found is a lot of people were trying to adjust to know people and working from home and all that. And now that we've kind of adjusted and mm -hmm. having to go back mm -hmm. to being around people, Mm -hmm. it is a very big, like you said, social, social anxiety. anxiety. I think social anxiety, the definition or the criteria for social anxiety, I think has to now change mm -hmm. only because social anxiety used to be in like more social settings. You really didn't get it at work necessarily. You really didn't, you had it in presentations and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But now a lot of people get anxiety just at the thought of having to deal that's exactly what it is. It's almost more acute when you think about it. Yeah. Like it's more severe um, than it was before. And so again, for somebody who's quite extroverted, I I can even know that it's like, nah, do I really want to go hang out with all those people? Nah, I just want to stay home. I think we've gotten accustomed to doing that because we had no choice. We had to. But when you think about the level of division that happened during the pandemic and how the world became so divided because of one concept versus another concept, that created so much animosity within um, our society and people. And Jody and I have talked about this before the level of anger people are having with post pandemic. And what's like, she said to me, like, what's the deal with people? People just seem to be so much more angry, angry. than they were before. And again, I think that really comes down to people struggling to cope emotionally and, and, and they're maxed out. If you look at the economy and the inflation and Canada and the U S are the same. I mean, it's ridiculous what it costs to live here and where I live, it's more expensive than New York. Like it's disgusting. Rental rent in general is almost, is more expensive than mortgage payments. Morning. Yeah. How much sense does that make? If you can't afford to buy a house, but you can, you, your rent is going to be double. Rent either. Yeah. Like, yep. no, it's ridiculous. And the stress that everybody is feeling. And then the fear that nobody's ever felt before with a pandemic and people already having anxiety and fear about health issues and everything else. Right now I'm a fairly healthy person and I wasn't overly fearful of COVID, but my mother <laughs> like literally paranoid. Um, my, the older generation paranoid, right? Because people were dying of COVID pneumonia, but myself not, it, it was just such there. And again, because of fear, what does that create anger and animosity? And, and it became so politicized. I think in the very beginning, we were all kind of united. Yeah. We didn't know what this was. It no. was really scary. We're all going to stay in and yeah. we'll do our part. Yeah. And then when it became political, and you can't yep. tell me it didn't become political. Oh, it totally became political. Yeah. 100% it did. And, and I don't care. I don't care who you are. This is not about right or wrong or whatever. It became fucking political. And then it, it became the people who cared versus the people who didn't. The people yeah. who were selfish mm -hmm. and the people that weren't. And one thing that I found out is that the United States, I don't know about Canada and I don't think Canada, but maybe United States, we are so fucking selfish, mm. fucking selfish. And so what happens is, I mean, there was a, there was at the dollar store, the person that worked at the dollar store sent someone, no, you can't come in. You don't have a mask. They mm. went home. And this goes back to our last podcast, got a gun, shot that person in the head and killed them. Yeah. That's sick. He's having to wear a fucking mask. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. Sense of entitlement to the extreme, like that's an extreme example in Canada, because we, as our last discussion, um, nobody has access to weapons the way that you guys do. But so nobody was getting shot or killed. But we definitely had people coming into establishments such as Starbucks. And this was like filmed by people where they deliberately just wouldn't wear a mask and they were asked to leave. And then they create massive drama. Yeah. My rights, my rights. I don't have to. I'm not going to leave. And they were actually physically removed by the police because, again, this is where society has become as so entitled 
Like back in the day, when you think about it, people followed rules and accepted those rules, whether they liked them or not, more so than they do now, because everybody has rights. And even law, like the, the law doesn't seem to apply to these people. Like this guy, he didn't care. I have anatomical rights and I don't want to wear a mask. And, and I mean, really what for? Just to be difficult? Yeah. And, yeah. and when you look at somebody's pathology and you're looking there, there's like, you're looking, you're like that person's, there's an example of mental illness. Anybody that is neurotypical or is, doesn't have extreme, wouldn't do that. Do I, did I, we didn't like wearing masks. Nobody liked to wear them, but you respected the autonomy of other people. It wasn't about you. It was about us as a, as a unit together collectively. But when you're yeah. that entitled that you go think it's okay to go shoot somebody and kill them because they wanted you to wear a mask. Ay, 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 ay. And you see, wanna... that also created the people who wore masks, the people who had autoimmune disorders, the people who had cancer, the people who had to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, I am terrified of going outside. Mm -hmm. And then when I go outside with my mask, I get harassed. Yeah, I know. See, I've again, had people like that. I have clients like that. It's that really not... sad. And again, yeah. if it doesn't have anything to do with you, what are you kidding? Don't talk. Yeah. And what is it? Our opinions. Now, this is a kind of a bit of a derogatory and gross statement, but an opinion is like an asshole. Everybody has one, but nobody likes unsolicited advice, right? Just shut up. Mind your own business. If it's not hurting you or affecting you, then just be quiet. But again, we live in a world now where everybody's so entitled to share their opinion, whether it's asked for or not. And again, it's not really that different in Canada. We've got lots of people. I'd like to say that for the most part, people followed the rules and were pretty good. But then there was the other side, again, because it became very political, the, the unvaccinated versus the vaccinated. Oh, and God. Created the whole effing dynamic and created more mental health stuff about that. And, you know, like, again, go back to the 30s and the 20s and the beginning of the state or the beginning stages of polio, which was the summertime disease or illness or sickness because kids got it. My grandmother had polio. My grand, or sorry, my great grandmother, my grandmother in the 50s was a nurse. And they were lining up for the vaccine, experimental vaccine that wasn't even proven safe because they didn't want to risk their children dying or getting sick and being paralyzed for the rest of their life. So again, people didn't have this adversity to, I have rights and I don't believe blah, 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 blah. There was like one form of communication through radio and people just kind of took it and ran with it. And the general public and everybody followed that construct. But now we have so many different opinions and varying yeah. thoughts and it confuses people. This is what creates cognitive dissonance. And it's adding to the overall mental health of our society. Because when people used to believe that a vaccine saved the lives of, of these children. Like smallpox. Remember smallpox? Small, smallpox. And it became eradicated. It's one of the only ones. It doesn't exist anymore. And if it did, we're talking about chemical warfare here. <laughs> we're talking about viral and back. Like we're talking about full on. Somebody's purposely done that because it's been eradicated due to vaccines. Now, regardless of whether you agree or you don't agree, there's some things with modern medicine that are great, but now we will it there's so much polarization people are like no the vaccine was created to kill people and blah 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 and you get and all mnra i'm not putting mnra in my yeah, body and it's hair. Not in your fucking body i get it <laughs> the fear of the unknown i understand that but here's the thing that i don't this is what i struggle to understand again because of that fear people become over opinionated and entitled if you're getting vaccinated okay you're protected so for the people who don't get vaccinated, why the fuck do you care? Ex yes. Thank you. Exactly. Why, why do you care? It doesn't, again, it doesn't matter if you're protected. Okay. I've been vaccinated against all the major shit. I had to, because I had to fight to the States. Couldn't leave the country unless I got vaccinated. Did I like the idea of it? Not overly because I knew it was new and I knew whatever, but it is what it is. And I had to do what I had to do because I got to live and I got to make money. And I got to survive. People are going to tell you, oh, you're going to die from the vaccine. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. Okay. So I will. Whatever. It, again, there has been oh. over 8 billion doses of the vaccine. I know. I know. Don't even get me started. Handful of people again, where does this come from? It perpetuates fear because of all these different concepts out there and cognitive dissonance. But at the end of the arc, at the end of the day, when this is becoming so polarized 
my mom and I couldn't even talk about it because she was so anxious and oh my God, in the news and this and that. And oh, these people are getting mad. I'm like, I can't even talk to you. The Her anxiety was just triggering me so badly because yeah. I was like, you're vaccinated. Shut the fuck up. Stop worrying about everybody else. You can't control it. Radical acceptance. <laughs> yeah. Um, my clients all the time. If Let anybody doesn't acceptance. know what radical acceptance is, let me read you the difficult the, the definition of radical acceptance. Jody and I have to work with people around this all the time. I have to use radical acceptance fucking daily. Doesn't mean I like it. No, we do. Okay, so radical acceptance is where is the definition? Oh, here it is is practicing a conscious effort to acknowledge and honor difficult situations and emotions, fully accepting things as they are instead of ignoring, avoiding, or wishing the situation were different can be mm -hmm. a crucial step in moving through a difficult experience to experiencing more meaning in everything. I will now, say you can wish things were different, <laughs> Yeah. But it's perseverating or ruminating on the yes. wishing things were different. That's what keeps you stuck. So in therapy, we often, I've had to do this myself, and it has been one of the most helpful tools is learning how to radically accept. Because when we can't control oh, a situation, we, we, we literally, we, can, we ruminate and we hold on to the what if and why can't and blah, 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 and this sucks. Again, acknowledge your emotions and your feelings are not right or wrong. They just are. That's they're what valid. acceptance, they're valid. And it's okay, but accepting it, it is. This goes back to the serenity or I prayer I use a lot with clients, which is grant me whether you believe in God, whether it's spirituality, whether it's Buddha, whether it doesn't matter. But it's a fucking it, rock. It doesn't it, matter. Whatever. Just grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. That is radical acceptance. Yeah. Give me the courage, grant me the courage to change the things I can, which is I can control my reactions and I can control myself, but nobody else. And give me the wisdom to know the difference between the two. I swear to God, when you talk about Dr. Marsha Linehan and dialectical behavioral therapy, that serenity prayer is the basis of that whole therapy modality, because that's really what it is when we struggle to emotionally regulate. So the world, stop trying to change other people's perceptions and perspectives, yes. focus on your own. It's the only thing that you can do. And what they do doesn't effing matter. It's what you do that matters. And this is where... I use this. So I've, I have probably used radical acceptance more with my clients since the pandemic. Yes, you have to ever. And okay. I worked in a prison. There you go. You and what is it? Fucking radically accept yes. that you are here and you yes, cannot dude, leave. you can't leave. But no in, in every day we call it on the streets, there was prison or on the, out on the street. So mm -hmm. on the streets, radical acceptance. I mean, I hate it. <laughs> like I've had to use it forever. My husband passed away. Radical mm. acceptance. My son has disabilities. Radical acceptance. My daughter has disabilities. Yeah. Radical. Yeah. So it's it's not like you're not you're. It doesn't mean that you have to be sunshine and rainbows. It means this is the hand that I was dealt. Mm -hmm. How's the best way to play my cards? Well, this is just it. And once you validate, that's when you can accept it, move on and not be stuck in the horrible yeah. feelings of anger, bitterness. And that's what it is. And then when people talk about forgiveness, see, that's what radical acceptance really is. It's not forgiveness. And it drives me nuts because it's the most invalidating thing that you can say to somebody who's had trauma is that, oh, you have to forgive the person. No, no. Fuck forgiveness that shit. is really for just, ourselves though. It is. It is for yourself, but not for the other person. And, but it's confused people. If you look at Dr. Judith Herman, who's like a four or a forefront, like a leader in trauma, she worked for the Depart department of Harvard for um, psychiatry for years and years and years, her and Dr. Bessel van der Kolk worked as a team together. And these guys are leading trauma experts. And she even says that religion really screwed people when it came to um, trauma survivors and victims of trauma because, and PTSD and CPTSD, because it was so invalidating to the person who had to survive rape that people are telling them to go forgive because that heals you. No, it's more radical acceptance that heals you, that you forgive your situation, but not to forgive because what's that doing? It's invalidating you. And it's also... But Okay, go ahead. Sorry. I oh, sorry. Yeah. It's invalidating, but it's also, it's what in context, what are you using forgiveness as? It's the wrong word. I understand the yes. theory behind it. It's just not the right word because when you think about forgiveness, it means that you are forgiving somebody for what they've done to you. That's not, but you know what? But that's not what this means. This I know. 
You look up the definition of forgiveness. Yes. I'm telling my clients this all the time. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness no. is, is I have to let go of my anger. Exactly. I have to let go of my whatever. But they need another I word. Have. Yeah. I have to take back control. Like mm -hmm. I've told you this. I've said this many times. My son was molested. I have a, I hate the person. He's fucking paroling at the end of this month. I am I not happy about it. Mm -hmm. And I don't forgive him. No, never. No, but I have to. And I hate that word forgive. I wish they would relabel Me it. Me too, because it needs, but that's my point in saying yeah. this. It needs to be relabeled because it's not forgiveness is what you're seeking. You're seeking to let go because yes. it heals you when you can let go. And you can, again, radically accept, have your feelings, validate your feelings, and then move on. And I am, I am not going to sit every single, do I think about it a lot? Yeah. I mean, it happened. But mm -hmm. I can't hold on mm -hmm. because that gives that person power and control. Mm -hmm. And for me to take the power and control back, it's like, mm -hmm. if you ask me about it or right in this moment, yeah, I'm fucking angry, mm -hmm. but only in this moment when I talk about it. So forgiveness is it happened. Yeah, mm -hmm. it actually happened. And you don't have to be okay with it. No, but, but let's use radical oh, acceptance instead of, instead yeah. of forgiveness. Because when you get the Christians and you get the people of different dialects of, of Christian faith, and let's just use Catholicism, for example, because I had a therapist who just says, oh, that's a bunch of Catholic bullshit. It makes me mad because they have somebody that just um, basically negates the sins. And then therefore it's for the person who created the crime. Please forgive me. So I don't have to feel the guilt and I don't have to. And that just completely not the victim. And that's pretty much victim shaming. Like when you think about it. So this is why people like Judith Herman and everybody said Catholicism in particular really fucked up there. And it's not to, to discriminate against Catholics. It's just, again, how is it that it's just a way for people to live with the mistakes and the things that they've done, but it really does invalidate the victim. So when victims think, oh, you know, I'm Catholic, so I have to forgive my rapist and I have to forgive the person that murdered my child. No, you fucking don't. Right. And, and As you've witnessed and you've experienced with your own son. Yeah. If you can forget, like if you can pardon them, that's, that's mm -hmm. good on you. That's you. I'm not going to take that away from you. Mm -hmm. That's what you well, want that's to what do. I, again, if that's what makes you feel better, but don't expect it when people no. say religious faith, oh, you need to forgive to heal. It is the stupidest thing you could ever say to somebody who's had a, a, such an injustice done to them. I deal with a lot of trauma as well. People with a lot of trauma, people with, that yeah. came from toxic relationships with their family, with re whatever, but people who have been sexually assaulted and they're like, I don't want to forgive. And I'm like, okay, let's, let's just relook at the real. And, and I do this with my clients. This is something I do on a regular basis. Let's look up the definition of, and then we read the definition and I say, okay, so what this is saying is you don't have to hurt in them. Mm -hmm. forgiveness is they're controlling my life still exactly my that's trauma right. is controlling yeah. and defining me right i need to take back yeah your control yes yeah I that's exactly what that my means. trauma yeah i need to state how yeah. it's going to affect me yeah exactly so that exactly. is radical acceptance it and is yeah so i hate i hate that forgiveness has become it's okay that you killed my son yeah no it's not that's no. not no. no, no, I will never forget watching a, she was a public speaker and she survived the Rwanda genocide. I forget her name. Immaculate. Oh, I've seen that. Yeah. I think I've seen She's it. She's an amazing woman. She's an amazing public speaker. And I was in Utah when I saw her speak and she was just absolutely brilliant. And I love her, but living in a bathroom for a month with four other women in a three foot, four foot bathroom stacked on top of each other, went in there at 170 pounds and came out, you know, 78 pounds because they were starved and had to survive and they were hidden she, that's where she developed her faith and her Catholic faith. She became a devoted Catholic and she did go and forgive the dictator of the other tribe that killed her entire family because that's how she healed. She walked in and, and forgave him. That's yeah, they met. what, you, you know, whereas I think I would personally have to find a different way to be able to let go of that pain and that trauma. I don't think I could actually go in and forgive that person for that. And I don't think that they deserve it. No, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't forgive the guy no. that, that molested my son. I don't forgive him and I never will. And you never will. And you don't <laughs> have to. That's again, because no. of her Catholic faith and what they teach, 
which is okay for her. And that took a lot of strength. That took a lot of strength. Exactly. That works for her. Uh Right. But But if it's like, okay, I need to forgive. Right. So I think super uncomfortable. Yeah. It makes me kind of, makes my skin crawl. Right. Um, Here's a really good definition of what forgiveness should be about before we move on. And that is when I was seven, eight years old, I was in grade three, my stepdad's class that at the time was not my stepdad, totally different topic. But <laughs> now little, humor there for little humor there for you. It's a good thing I moved away and wasn't living there when that went down. Anyway, <laughs> um, I was going up, driving up the road with my dad and my two sisters. We were going to swimming lessons and my dad was a firefighter and we were driving up the road and it's a tiny little street and a truck was coming towards us. And literally it happened right in front of us. I will never forget. I still, it's ingrained in my brain forever, but this little boy ran out in front of the other truck. He was playing chicken and he went after a ball and this other guy just didn't even have a chance to stop. And he hit him and his shirt got caught on the bumper of the truck and he kept driving. This little boy would have been roughly around my age. My dad pulled over the truck right away, jumped out. The guy who got out of the truck who hit him was about to roll him over. My dad's like, I don't touch him. Run inside and go call 911. And this would have been in 1988. So we're going back a few years. Um, My dad was sitting there holding this little boy's head, okay, supporting his neck. And my sisters and I were just in shock. And you could tell this little boy was unconscious. Like there was nothing, you know, that you we didn't know. And it felt like forever. And then finally, my dad came back to the truck to move the vehicle off further off to the side of the road because he needed to be able to talk to the paramedics. His hand was covered in blood. He had blood clots all over his hand. I've never, to this day, will never forget. And he had to do this to the gear shift to move it because his hand was covered in blood. And we were all crying. And he's like, it's okay. It's okay. I'll be, I'll be back. And it just felt like forever. He finally came back. We turned the truck around and we went home. We obviously didn't go to swimming. And I said, dad, is he going to die? And he goes, I don't know, honey. I don't know. Well, the the hospital called him because my dad was a first responder, even though he was off duty. And he had died on the way to the hospital of internal bleeding and injuries. And my dad knew because his pupils were all dilated. He had major head trauma and he was choking on blood. And like he was, he was not going to live. We lived in a very small community and I don't, I will never forget going to school the next day because I was in the class of the little boy's dad who hit him and killed him. And when it came on the announcement that they were going to have a memorial service for the little boy in grade two, David, who was hit. And it was Dave Whitmore in my class, but this guy was little David Serenius. So I'll never forget. And that we we're having a memorial service. And it was just the saddest thing. And you looked over at little David in my class and he was crying because it was his dad that killed him. And then this is the most amazing act of forgiveness I've never, I've ever seen in my entire life. And I was no more than eight years old. I will never forget it. I walked into the gymnasium when we were about to have the service for little David that was killed and his parents were standing there and Dave Whitmore out of my class, his dad, um, Wayne was just inconsolable. He was a wreck and he was hysterically crying. And the parents of little David who died grabbed him and hugged him and consoled him. And their son was dead. Now that to me is an act of forgiveness that is used in the right context. He couldn't have stopped it. He will forever be traumatized that he accidentally hit that little boy and killed him. <clears throat> There's nothing you could have done. But these people took him in their arms and they hugged him and they all cried and they consoled him. Now that's the power of what true forgiveness should be about. Not about forgiving somebody who molests your son. Like if he was drunk driving. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, this was an innocent driving home from work. It was, but that's the power of forgiveness. And it should be used in that context, not to forgive people who are sadistic or deliberately go out and are punitive and hurt people. And that's, I think that causes, again, the not correct definition causes so much stress and anxiety going back to that anxiety in people because I have had so many people say to me but I can't forgive them and it's like Mm -hmm. I have to reassure them you don't have to you don't have to forgive them it's not the right word it's not the right it's just a terrible context of the word and again it came from Catholicism and faith and not not to bash faith it really isn't believe in what you want and if that works for you that's great but it is so invalidating to people that have been so wrongly 
um, hurt and abused or taken advantage of or whatever. Um, but going back to, you know, where the world is right now and the mental health issues and the level of anger and the level of division and whatever, I think radical acceptance has been a really pinnacle point of this conversation tonight that has been so good because again, stop worrying about everybody else and, and stop judging everybody else and what they do and what they don't do. Worry about you, right? Don't and be angry that so-and-so didn't get a vaccine, you know, because it affects you because your daughter has cancer. If you guys have been vaccinated, you know, then you're okay. Now to those who can't get vaccinated because of health issues, that's, that's tricky and that's hard. And I, and I do, I do understand that. I do understand that right to those that don't. But again, when it comes to what you can control and what you can't control radical acceptance. I actually have clients and friends who can't get vaccinated. No, nope. I, know, I know people that can't but- take so they'll wear masks out and they're like, this is where also anxiety comes in. Mm-hmm. When I go to the store and I see people with masks, I don't care. I yeah, don't no, care. I don't either. No, I have been sick and I'll mm-hmm. wear a mask out, which mm-hmm. I never, well, yeah, I did before, not as much, but I did it once. Uh, my son, right before the pandemic, he had a really, really bad cough. Right. And he said, and he tested for antibodies. They said that wasn't COVID. Mm-hmm. COVID came like he was in the end of November, December. No, I think he was in February. Sorry. Mm-hmm. But um, they said it wasn't, they didn't know about COVID at the time, but they said it was the cold. And then we got to him tested for antibodies. So it wasn't COVID, but I told him, I said, where, yeah, it was because I said, wear a mask to school. And then that following week, they closed the schools because of COVID. Mm-hmm. But um, so I had him wear a mask because he was coughing You know, it's not a bad thing to care about not getting other people ill. No, again, it comes down to uh, uh, being selfless. And it's like, again, you know, weighing the pros and the cons. You can't tell somebody that you force them to go do something where once upon a time as a society we did. But now, again, it's going back to what you can control and what you can't. You're not going to be able to control other people. So that level of anger and animosity because of your fear I think this is something as a mental health issue that is kind of a generalized within society that needs to be kind of faced and needs to be addressed that it go, it come, it really does come down to focus on what you can do rather than what you can't. And this perpetual state of anger that Jody and I have been talking about before and noticed and the level of animosity, you know, is that really just the pandemic or is it just a, is it just a, um, one of the factors of many factors that are contributing to everybody's stress levels and angry, angriness, right? When you think about where we are in the world today with inflation and all the other things and political subjects, such as gun, guns, lack of guns, as well as um, Roe versus Wade and abortion and all that crazy stuff, right? I, uh, I, there's a bunch, you can Google it. I don't have them handy, but I had sent Bree some. There's a bunch of articles on, yes, if you've noticed people being more road rage, people being really aggressive on the road. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Since the pandemic, statistically, yes, people Mm -hmm. are taking their whatever out. Mm -hmm. And again, because you have to have a diagnosable mental health issue, plus people will feel this is not a mental health issue. It's just road rage. It is. Road it, rage it's, it's on a spectrum. From yes. something. Yes. Anger. Where does anger stem from? Fear or hurt? It's hurt. Yes. That's what it is. So, so there's something underlying. You're hurt, you're in pain, or you're in fear. And I think more of it's fear, fear. driving everything or that they've lost somebody from the pandemic or something crucial has happened. I have seen, I cannot tell you, but again, I'm in LA. I cannot tell you how many, we were coming home from Disneyland and there was this, oh, I'm driving. There's no one behind me, no one in front of me. The freeway was fairly not crowded based on it being 11 o'clock at night or whatever. And this Mm -hmm. car just comes flying at, I was probably going 75, maybe 80, Mm -hmm. flying and cuts, almost hits me. Mm. couldn't wait to get in the lane gets in my lane I just told my son I'm like whoa that I'm staying away from that and then we saw him go into other lanes and he pushed another car across the freeway and then they started getting into it and I'm like there's a higher patrol up there hopefully that higher patrol will catch them 
there has been, I, there has been so much road rage. I worked in prison. I dealt with inmates that were in there for reasons of road rage or reasons of rage because they're criminals. Well, they, you know, <laughs> so it's like, cause I did, I did a reception center and I'd be like, what are you in for? We'd have it there, but it was like aggravated assault or whatever, but they would tell me it was road rage. Right. But I have seen, I have seen it almost daily on the freeway people. And there have been articles, look up pandemic post pandemic road rage. But that's because road rage, sorry to interrupt you, Jodes, but oh, go ahead. like literally road rage, everybody hides behind the steering wheel. It's where they can let their anger and their aggression out. And it's acceptable because they're high, they're behind glass and they're moving. Yeah. So it's like, it's, it's impersonal unless mm-hmm. you pull over on the side. Now people right. have guns, but it's like, people have become, mm-hmm. and it's, it's a weird, honestly, it's kind of a paradox, if you will, because we're isolated, we're in introverted, but then you have the anger and the frustration of all of that coming out. Cause yeah. it's coming out that way, because again, it's a, it's a juxtaposition. It's of, just a position. Well, I'm really introverted and I have anxiety going to see people, but get out of my fucking way. You motherfucker. I'm because that's really how I'm dealing with the anxiety and the fear of having to deal with my, my inner conflict and struggles. It's yeah. a constant state of ambi- being ambiguous. Yeah. We've got several different parts that you're struggling with. And so where does it come out on the road? And the anger and the road rage or people lipping people off or just being rude or just being nasty. And it's a grocery store. And it's like, it's like, again, where did the word Karen's come from? Yes. Right. Describe my mom's name was Karen. So I don't feel my aunt's name is Karen, but she actually is the definition of a Karen. So it's quite funny. Oh no, my mom actually was not, but a Karen, you know, somebody who like, there was, I remember seeing a video of this elderly lady. She was an Mm -hmm. elderly lady laying on the floor and throwing a tantrum in Costco because they made her wear a mask and she wasn't going to wear it. It's like, in what world does you need to put a mask on constitute? I'm going to come back and kill you, or I'm going to lay on the floor and throw a toddler fit. That's what we call personality disorder, Jody. (laughs) Sorry. I'm just going to say it. That's like not being able to control your emotions. Like seriously, you're going to throw Very tantrum. emotional on dysregulation. Control. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Emotional dysregulation. But again, as an adult over wearing a mask, nobody's asking you to cut off your left arm. Nobody's like, think about what you're reacting to. And don't, again, don't in the comments, please say it's asphyxiating. We're going to get epoxia, blah, blah, blah. Because surgeons wear them for hours. All day long. End. And they don't suffer from it. They don't have brain damage because of lack of oxygen in their carbon, carbon and dioxide. And they don't die. We're not having new surgeons every surgery. As no. And die. again, nobody's having long-term effects from carbon dioxide inhalation. And it's you know ridiculous. what? Gray's Anatomy, Chicago Med, I Any of it. those medical programs, they wear masks for this during scene. filming. And guess for what? 16 hours a day. Yes, those scenes don't take the five minutes that we watch. No, work, I worked in film time. years ago. We're talking sometimes 12 to 18 hour days. So, and having to do a scene over and over, over and over and over. So mask is on and off, on and off, on and off. Now, yeah. So again, like masks. I'm not a fan of, although I think I've never looked better. <laughs> By wearing, I mean, wearing a mask, I looked amazing. <laughs> I think we all did because everybody focused on eyes because you couldn't see your mouth. Your eyes, yeah. Um, and it was great because you go to the store and you see somebody, you're like, I don't want to talk to them. Maybe they won't notice me. And they don't because you're in a mask. <laughs> yeah, I know. There were some benefits to the mask. I know. But, I know. you know, a lot of people, it's not like we were like, yes, we get to wear masks. It was I know when my son was little, he was allergic to eggs. He's still allergic to eggs, but luckily can eat them now. It might change. But so he couldn't get the flu shot. So to protect him for the first time ever, I got flu shots because I thought if I can't bring it home, if I can stay healthy, I will not affect my son. Yeah. And that's a personal decision for you. And then that's what you need to do. But these people that are out there trying to push their agenda on everybody and what they should and shouldn't do and getting so defensive and hypercritical of other people. And again, we've gone from a society where we were able to follow regular basic social construct laws are in place for a reason. Social construct is here for a reason. 
moved to so far left now where everybody feels like they have the right to do whatever the fuck they want, not follow any form of social construct and throwing these brutal tantrums over wearing a mask. Again, go back in time when people were dying and being paralyzed from polio or smallpox or World War II killed 95% of your family members because they were all men and had to go to war. You weren't bitching about wearing a fucking mask. Sorry, there's my there's my my strong opinion coming out. <laughs> and to those who don't agree, it's not to be I'm not trying to be disrespectful. You can believe whatever you want, but you do you, but don't be so critical of the other people that don't agree with you. That that right there. If it doesn't affect you. Exactly. How does my wearing a mask? The doesn't. way it would affect you is that I won't get anything contagious, mm -hmm. hopefully onto you. But right. how does it affect your mental well-being? Exactly. It shouldn't. It doesn't. it doesn't. It shouldn't. Move along. Yeah. Well, ask yourself why. Again, this is something about like growth and self-awareness. And even as a clinician, you're questioning people all the time. If they're not, you're not checking your behavior and why you do what you do, you should be. Because that's what all humans should really do. That's how we grow. You'd be surprised how many don't. But again, ask yourself why it's concerning you so much, because the problem goes within yourself and a lot deeper than it is to do with anybody else. Not, and again, I think as a society, something that we've just touched upon here is the it's the it's the level of entitlement that people feel now that didn't once upon a time exist. We cared more about other people, but now we care more about ourselves. And there's a level of self righteousness and narcissism that is on the rise because of that. If you go to different cultures around the world, say South America, Guatemala, third world countries, they have this thing called interpersonalism, where they, they learn interpersonal development, not independence so early on, which means that they actually take into consideration those around them before they are all about themselves. And in North America, we don't do that. We've done a really poor job of introducing interpersonalism. It's all about me, 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 me. And that's what's fed this problem. And what's really, I think, kind of sad is you can be selfish and selfless. Yes. And the way that you can do that. Like I use this analogy. All, I don't think it's an analogy. Maybe. I don't know. All the time. If the oxygen mask come out of an airplane, you put it on yourself first before your child. Because you can't I help know, wait, wait. passed out. I know when I was a child, I thought mm -hmm. that was the most fucking selfish thing in the world. Mm -hmm. What? You want children to die? But yeah. as an adult, I've learned if you can't, if you don't have it on your mask, you're not going to be able to help anybody else. Yeah, so exactly. You have to help yourself. So when yeah. it comes to being selfish, it's helping mm -hmm. yourself, taking care of you. I wouldn't see you selfish. Order to take care of other people. Exactly. I wouldn't even call it selfish. I think, again, we now in mental health, I mean, up here in Canada anyways, more, we use self-care because yeah, it, self -care caring about self yourself versus then being selfish because it's not about being selfish. It's about giving a level of self-care so that you can be as the most functional, helpful, useful person to those around you. Yes. So again, but once upon a time, we as a society and people and, and culture were far more caring of our neighbor than we are now. It's gone almost so far to the other end of the spectrum that now we live in this world of entitlement. My way is the right way. It's my opinion matters. Yours doesn't. And again, this level of animosity and anger continues to rise. It's become a society of love thy neighbor as thyself. Unless thy neighbor is different than thyself, then we try to change thy neighbor to be thyself. And if they don't change thy, th themselves to be like thyself, then we hate them. Wow. Well said, Jody. <laughs> I yes. got it. That was impressive, but that's exactly <laughs> it. So I think we're pretty much almost time up here, yes. but um, I think it's, it's you got to say on that note, <laughs> on, that note, on that note, I think that, I don't know if you guys have any comments on, on this, or if you, if there's another topic that you want to, I, Dr. Larman and I to discuss in regard that could, you know, be um, uh that that could come out of this session basically or this podcast of what we talked about whether it's on forgiveness or if it's on again where this anger can go what we need to do as a society what you think would be you know helpful or what as a collective we all need to focus on but i think radical acceptance has been a really 
um, good starting point. Yeah. Again. So if you know people or you're a person yourself who doesn't often question your motives or why you do sit there and think about it for just a second, because I'm sure you'll be able to actually come to the conclusion that it's a way deeper underlying issue below what's going on ar around the world than what's presenting and why you're so strongly opinionated one way versus the other. And after you do that, it is perfectly okay to go to therapy and yes. work on it. Yes. Honestly. And Guys, again, everybody needs a therapist. I'm sorry. I, I, have one. I wouldn't, I would die without mine because we're human. We're not meant to be robots. We're not perfect. It would be pretty boring if we were. So again, go talk to somebody because everybody needs human connection to talk to. Yes. And these safe places to go where you get to say all the things that you're so scared to say where nobody judges you. And you know what? That's where that anger and stuff, mm -hmm. the fear based mm -hmm. in fear, based in hurt, based in whatever. And yeah. mental mental health, I'm not talking about mental illness. I'm talking about mental well-being. If you are afraid, if you live in a small town and you don't want other people to know you're going to mental health, with Zoom therapy now, anybody in your state that's licensed in your state doesn't have to be in okay. your state. Nope. So you can talk to somebody who's in a totally different state. Yep. You can talk to somebody that's up north, down south, yep. that's east, right. west. So there's really no excuse. And in, no, there isn't. in the United States, it's not free. I get it. Like it is in Canada, but well, not all the time. It depends on your insurance coverage, but yes. Okay. So our healthcare is not free. It's anything but free, but I know. there is free mental health. California has led. I love California. People hate it. I love it, but has led the way to free mental health. All you have to do in the United States is go to your state website and type in free mental health mm -hmm. and it should bring up all the ways. And people don't want to do that because one, it's, it's an excuse mm -hmm. to, oh, it's going to be community mental health. They don't know anything. No, the best outcome, the best predictor of outcome in therapy is the rapport between the client and the clinician. Mm -hmm. I am very big on credentials. So they must be credentialed and licensed in whatever category it is. Yeah. A hundred percent. I'm not about this, the, the coaches and self-help gurus. I'm sorry. I'm just not, no. Nope. but, um, but if you look it up and you can go clinician shopping, if you don't get mm -hmm. a good vibe, go to another one, just do it. Mm -hmm. It's not the paranoid schizophrenic down the street that talks to people and harasses people. They need therapy too. I'm not saying yeah, that, but, but yes. that doesn't mean you need mental health. No, anybody and everybody. And if you have this, this strong, whatever, anger, all of that, please go talk to somebody. Yes. Right note <laughs> we're gonna call it quits you guys let us know um any other topics that you can think of or interests that you may have give um dr larman and i put, um, put it in the comments the comments below so that we can they can we can work on it maybe one of our topics will be medical systems yeah we and got all we're food. open but right please, so we're open to anything so let us know we love 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 your comments we do but please at mm -hmm. least make them I mean, that I, there's some comments that I read that I'm like, I don't even know the point this person is trying to make. I really don't. I had someone leave a comment that was a weird word. I don't even know if it was word. And I'm like, are you just leaving a comment or? Well, or as, we, as we work in the world of mental health, we know that there's some sound people out there and there are some yeah. not. Again, <laughs> so, we see some interesting stuff, but yes. Click the little them. bell. That mm -hmm. will let you know every time we drop an episode, which is usually going to be about every two weeks, leave a comment. You can comment in the comment section or you can email us at WCWYCW1, which is why complain when you can whine. So WCWYCW1 at Gmail and topics, wines. Brie was a sommelier. So once can, upon a time. Her. Yeah. If you've got wine questions, let me know. And glass suggestions, anything, yes. alcohol, drink suggestions. If you have yes. some cool drinks, anything, Absolutely. everything, we'd love to hear with you, hear from you. And thank you guys. Yes. Thanks. Bye everyone.